रोशनी का कारवां दिस पॉडकास्ट इज ब्रॉट टू यू बाय स्कोर फाउंडेशन Hi my name is George Abraham and welcome to Iway Conversations my guest today is Dr Sharad Philip a practicing psychiatrist Hi Sharad welcome Hi sir Sharad uh, I you know you are a doctor professionally uh, and I just wanted to ask you uh, do you think blind and visually impaired people can take the liberty of aspiring to be doctors or medical professionals Well sir my straight up answer is yes i believe that every person with disability should aspire to get into the healthcare professions should get into the medical professions there's lots of things that the entire medical community can learn from them and most importantly if service and quality and all the things that need to be improved can be improved it's only going to be with the disabled people and the disabled community entering into medicine now there are challenges yes it's not an easy road at all and it's uh, a little unheard of it's difficult uh, to put it mildly but i don't think it's impossible as for liberties to aspire i think the sky is the limit for anybody for anybody who wants to apply their mind who has the right opportunities and the resources there's no limit to what they can or what they should not do nothing like that sir my opinion yes they should you've uh, qualified to be a doctor you did your mbbs and then your md and you got several diploma course diploma degrees also in your specialized area uh, so maybe you could share with us uh, some of the challenges that um, you faced on your journey uh, starting from uh, the entrance i'm someone who has retinitis pigmentosa and the feeling i sight didn't really help we trying to convince people that i can do medicine so for starters the first person that i had to try and convince was the ophthalmologist was the eye doctor pronouncing my diagnosis and telling me that you should not take science stream not just with him but then also with uh, my father who had uh, been convinced that you know it's going to be a uh, uh, quite an arduous uphill uh, endeavor for me to do that and just going to fa- fail flat out i had to face a lot of uh, challenges with regard to trying to explain it to myself my self doubt uh, the doubt of people around me the next two years consecutively i got into the armed forces medical college i was there for the uh, interviews and all of that and i was just trembling trying to think of how am i going to clear the physical because i know that they are saying they will not take a person with an eyesight problem like mine and uh, by god's grace my jesus favor i just got into christian medical college ludhiana at that point of time and through that through whatever tests that were done at that point of time i was able to clear those tests with ease entrance exams were horrible for me i had given almost 20 entrance exams a year that was the time when there was no need and everything you had to give separately i would kind of try and ask um, each invigilator can you please let me sit next to the window can you please let me uh, sit under the tube light and there would be many times where uh, i was not able to make out where i was marking um, i lost out on a couple of entrance exams because the sequence on the optical mark reader sheet you know you had to color those uh, sheets with the a b c d and then it would just you know kind of spit out your score once it goes through a scanner so if you get the sequence wrong like right? for example you're doing the second row and you're starting from 50 uh, one and suppose you start marking from 52 so after that whatever you're doing every answer goes wrong if you miss just one and there was so many things that i had to learn by doing uh learn by experimenting over there because i felt there was no one really who would understand and anybody i go and tell this problem to would just simply say why the hell are you getting into this why are you making it difficult for yourself so that didn't was you, that no but didn't you look at uh, getting a scribe to help you out at that point no actually there wasn't a provision for a scribe and we're talking about 2002 2003 i wasn't aware 
of these things either. I wasn't aware that my disability, uh, if told and talked about, would actually help me. I thought it would be something if I revealed to people, it would be a limiting factor. It would be something that would kill my dreams. When you got into medical college, uh, uh, obviously people around you would have realized that you have an eye problem. Your professors would have felt it. Uh, how did they respond and how did they kind of facilitate your journey through? Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's an important thing. I mean, I, I found their responses to be quite like the rest of the community. Um, it was not very welcoming, uh, if you say on the overall, but there were these islands of really good people, supportive people who were there. Uh, the It just takes one or two or maybe even uh, just a small group of people to actually make a person with disabilities life better. Um, but, you know, the entire thing um, hinges on what the majority opinion is. And, you know, one or two negative comments also tends to depress you. So uh, I had one of my anatomy uh, teachers tell me, uh, you know, what you're doing is not right. The, uh, there's going to be a problem uh, tomorrow. There is a patient who comes to you. That patient's going to feel at a disadvantage compared to uh, other people. You may not be able to pick up and be a good diagnostician. Um, and at that time, it was like, I really didn't understand why people were saying that it's, I mean, it almost felt like the eyes were studying medicine and not me. Uh, it, it almost felt, uh, you know, if I didn't have uh, the proper eyesight, I didn't belong there. Um, but yes, uh, there were times where I was able to do this and this was just through uh, a lot of prayer and support and a lot of uh, uh, help that I got. So uh, one of the things was I actually came third in my entire batch for a dissection competition. Um, I had to dissect the back of the knee and show some vessels and nerves and all of that. And I came third and I didn't really get uh, how I did it so well, but I just did it. And uh, I, I, I really thought there that, you know, my, my dream of being a surgeon and all of that would be uh, something that I could do based on that. Now, from there, I, I did see that a lot of other faculty would not uh, be quite supportive. So I had to go out the extra mile to show that I belong there. So for that, I would try to take on extra tasks, extra responsibilities, be volunteering for presentations, for tutorials, uh, for discussions and try to uh, show, uh, you know, all throughout that I, I'm there, I'm studying, I, I can understand what you're saying and I'm, I'm good, I'm good as good as anybody else. And uh, my, my whole achievement uh, oriented uh, philosophy started from there that I had to show that I am the best, not just one amongst them. I had to show that I was the best. So I had very supportive uh, classmates who were there with me who um, would just revise uh, the topics with me and you know I would just hear and I was starting to learn by the year and I could go and reproduce whatever I was told better than the people who told it to me and that started getting me a reputation that started uh, separating me from whatever people had in their mind about a person with visual impairment doing uh, medicine. Yes, there were some clinical postings, there were issues with uh, uh, things, but then even those could be surmounted. You could always be tested on alternate things. It's actually the, uh, the, uh, the learning uh, and the understanding that should be tested rather than, you know, a person's eyesight or the strength of one's hand or whether they can walk about or not or stand in an operation theater. All of these things appear you know, superfluous, uh, if you ask me, sir. What's important is that people with uh, the right abilities and the right understanding and the right learning are there and we should do everything to retain them. If you know of anyone with vision impairment who needs guidance on living life with blindness, please share the IWA National Toll Free Helpline number one eight. 00532046 the number is 18005320469 now when you're doing medicine there are uh, also clinics with ophthalmology with um, 
various uh, uh, departments or various uh, branches of uh, medicine where uh, as, a, as a medical student, you are kind of put through the grind so that you learn. So uh, there are these branches where the eye or being able to see is very critical. Uh, do you have any experiences there to share? Yes, sir. I, I really have. I mean, one of the things was the microscope. The microscope and me, we are not friends. Because the moment I try to look into it, it used to be so bad. I just couldn't make out. There was so much of uh, blur. There were so many floaters. There would be so many things that I could, couldn't just make out. I mean, people would say there are these colors. They could identify cells. And I, for the life of me, I could not understand why this is a basophil and this is not a new uh, this is not a neutrophil uh, these are cell types these are white blood cell types but then uh, i i understood that just being able to identify this is uh, kept as a basic competency so if there's some way where i could uh, you know look at a magnified picture or be able to tell them that these are the characteristics with which i would differentiate one from the other it may not be that I have the eyesight to be able to differentiate it myself, but if I could get another person by describing it to them, you know, in the simplest of terms and be able to help them differentiate between uh, that, I think that should suffice. So, so one thing was very clear for me. I'm not going into medicine demanding that in spite of my eyesight, I be allowed to, in spite of my eye problems, I be allowed to do everything that a person with superb eyesight needs to do. I'm not wanting to be an ophthalmologist. I'm not wanting to be uh, an expert surgeon or any of those things. My, my entire intention was to get the whole aspect of being trained in medicine so that I can take the next step to try and understand what I should do towards helping people. Not every person who gets trained in MBBS remains in medicine. A lot of them move out into research. A lot of them move out into public health, policy, management. So um, I think this is something that should be kept in mind. You opted to do psychiatry. Now, uh, was this a decision that was made for you or you chose? So, sir, my initial dream when I got into medicine and surgery, I'm sorry, when I got into MBBS was to be a good diagnostician in terms of wanting to, uh, you know, be, be able to understand whatever problems that people came with. So my aim was that. Slowly, I enjoyed doing a lot of orthopedics and my orthopedic uh, 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 orthopedics teachers, professors and faculty really enjoyed uh, working with me. And I actually got a lot of chances uh, in, in cutting. So I scrubbed up and I've even assisted my HOD in some surgeries. And I did it with whatever with whatever sight that I had. And when I was doing something wrong, they were kind enough to tell me that, see, this is where you're going wrong. Just hold on. Just don't do this more. So I have actually scrubbed up for as many surgeries as possible. And I don't think I have done any less than any of my peers or batchmates. But that said, yes, I had to choose psychiatry. Um, uh, initially, I didn't really... Uh, know um, that this was uh, an option that I would like. But then I got into it because uh, I had to do my service obligation uh, for doing my medicine in CMC. And that was a time where two and a half years, I worked straight out in psychiatry. And I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed dealing and working with people with substance use, working with families, a person with severe mental illnesses. I really loved supporting families who had children with intellectual disability and autism and all of those things. And so much so that uh, there were periods where I was the only person in that entire department. Uh, eight to five, eight to four, uh, things would work. And then after four, it was just me. So I was handling everything uh, over there. And I, I, I just wanted the full on experience and I never let go uh, of uh, psychiatry after that. So then from there, it was another journey to Nimhans and learning that, uh, uh, I could I could actually take help for my disability came when I went to Nimhan. To support our work with the blind and visually impaired, you can visit the donate page on our website www.scorefoundation.org.in. Please note www.scorefoundation dot org dot in 
So, uh, Sharad, uh, on this note, I just wanted to also ask you, you know, there are a number of uh, visually impaired people, blind people who have taken up medicine when their eyesight were perfectly normal. But uh, along the way, they, for whatever reason, have lost their sight or are losing their sight, uh, maybe during the uh, period of studying medicine or when they have qualified and they are already in the profession. Uh, and you've had dealings with them, you've been supporting them, you've been engaging with them. What has your experience been? Well, sir, if you ask me, I think they are the best experts that we need in medicine. So someone who's been fully trained, someone who's had sight and, you know, had uh, uh, the experience of losing vision as well, they would be problem solving so much. They would be coping through all of the things at such a high level that there's a lot that we can all learn from them. I think their lives are like books that we can use, that we can read, that we can learn from uh, in, in, in understanding how things can be done better. I, I would like to tell you a story about someone called Jacob Bolletin. Now, Jacob Bolletin is someone who was working in the uh, late Ni uh, uh, 19th and the 20th centuries, the, the late 19th and the early uh, 20th century. He was he he someone who was completely blind. He was born blind, and he is known and understood to be the one of the first doctors uh, with visual impairment. And there's a foundation named after him. There's an award named after him in the U.S. Now, he uh, was someone who people kept going to because. He was someone who was not using the stethoscope. He would actually put his ear to the chest of the patient and then make out stuff. And there are times he's actually saved people's lives. He's found out things that other people were not able to find. So the, the ways that people are able to, uh, you know, find alternate means of doing something is important. It's not just one way that, uh, you know, you don't need to be someone who has complete vision. Uh, to be a very good dermatologist. Uh, now, I, I'm mentioning the story of someone called David Hartman. Uh, he's someone who completed medicine in the US uh, 1976 to 1980. Uh, he would just be able to buy the touch. He, he's someone who had uh, become completely blind by the age of eight and entered uh, training with blindness. He would be able to touch with his uh, hand and uh, with his fingers, he'd be able to realize what sort of a dermatological lesion it was, and he would be able to prescribe them. Of course, uh, you know, when you're looking at that, there's so many changes that that hospital allowed him to do. He would have his guide dog allowed inside the hospital. There would be a nurse, uh, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant who would be there with him to work with him and uh, complete things. But then, uh, what I'm trying to say here is he is no less a doctor. In fact, he came out, he, he outranked everybody in his batch. He graduated magna cum laude and did superbly well. In a place like India, where there's so much of mindset opposition um, uh, and, and um, uh, biases, uh, how have people actually responded? Um, are there any, other, any, any of these people you've met in India who have completed their course or who are continuing to practice as uh, professionals? Yes, sir, there are quite a few. Well, the first way that people I have seen have responded is they actually internalize a lot of the things that are going around them. Yeah. The mindsets that you're talking uh, are of ableism. Yeah. So very simply put, everybody around you thinks that the opposite of ability is disability. The opposite of ability is inability. Disability and inability are two different things. They need to be differentiated. Yeah. And I think these people with disability are the ones who will be able to show that and showcase that the best. Now, as they internalize it, they themselves uh, go through an entire mental health crisis there. You know, shattered uh, dreams, uh, aspirations, uh, feelings that what will I do? So a uh, particular person I know had completed all of his studies and just towards the fag end of his course, the fag end where he had to actually start doing an internship, he started experiencing rapid vision loss. Within one year, he completely lost his sight. And uh, now what is he supposed to do? Is he, is he a worthless doctor now? 
no actually he's learned he's understood things he's he's capable in many ways so people should be encouraged in that aspect that there are people who respond uh, with uh, defiance as well there there are people who try to uh, work things out try to problem solve by showing that they are just as good at uh, as the others because they are masking whatever their problems are and that itself doesn't work so trying to say that you know no no you don't have a problem uh, you can work without the assistance you don't need a scribe or you don't need the extra help or you don't need the extra time all of these things don't work till i told my professors that sir with my current eyesight i am not able to make out on the x ray that you are making a red mark or you are asking for a point i am not able to make out i i i wasn't able to discuss a solution with them so they said okay what we'll do is we'll just take a white doctor's tape make a point out of that and put it there and you identify that particular point based on your understanding of anatomy and i was able to do that so uh, we need to be able to discuss this we need to be able to overcome that initial uh, mindset which is internalized in, inside of us you've written a lot of papers you've also traveled across the world uh, you've been to israel you've been to uh, romania you've been to nepal what has been your general experience in terms of travel in terms of networking oh sir sure. that's uh, that's a, that was a whole different experience so when i finished my md and my training i just had this inquisitiveness inside me i want to find out if there's someone else who's you know had some similar journeys so i thought the best way would be to go for international conferences i thought everybody would come for that so i tried to get into as many international conferences as i could i started uh, presenting papers research i got a lot of awards i the, the the trip that you were mentioning to israel was something which was supported by the department of science and technology from india and i got a scholarship to go there and present in the bioethics conference over there i also had uh, the opportunity that you're mentioning for romania I was an award from the world association and they recognized me as an early career fellow so then the whole thing is i mean everybody expects uh, that a person with normal and full abilities is going to come but the moment they see that there's a white cane in your hand uh, it's a totally different expression i mean i have had people staring at me incredulously at least i i kind of feel them staring or i imagine them they would they be looking at me uh thinking what's going on why i'm there like that yes networking has been tough uh in terms of i may not be able to recognize people uh where they are when they are okay did i meet this person i have to recognize them by their voice or i wait for them a lot of people have been sensitive uh to this and then they come and tell me hi hi sarad this is uh, this is uh, this is mendes or this is victor and those kinds of things are also there to be celebrated and noted of course i do network a little bit try to find out who else is going and then i get to know and i ping them and plan things to do so we've gone on visits and tours and all of those things i i i believe i've not let myself Uh, down um, by saying that i can't experience this because i don't have the vision or i don't have my full eyesight you call yourself an activist so tell us something <laughs> about your activism any person who's going through a problem is actually the best activist so i try to support people through whatever they're going through and then work out in that uh, but there are times where you know you really see that can't really work out uh, they really are not able to do that themselves or they are not able to come to that place to do that so i've been trying to write letters along we have an entire network across india called doctors with disabilities i lead the 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 sec uh, the section on people with sensory disabilities and visual disabilities so we've been trying to write, write letters in important su- uh, supreme court cases and talk about that i've been also working on uh, job identification notifications and trying to analyze that and respond uh, to the um, uh, to the need which is there the um, unemployment figures for persons with disabilities are so stark and so different from the general population something needs to be done so those are some of the efforts that i have taken up i have written to the papers i have 
had some statements and uh, some details and all also provided. I've also tried to advocate about the medical system uh, of admissions, of selection, of teaching, also be more disabled friendly. So now that's a work in progress. Um, that feels like, you know, you have to go against the tide. Uh, but I think people are more responsive. They are becoming more and more aware. And uh, this is the best time. I mean, there's never been a better time than this because all the legislations, all the frameworks are quite uh, supportive now. And it's a matter now of how we uh, increase awareness and improve our advocacy efforts. Sharad, uh, you and your two siblings, uh, all three of you are blind. Uh, uh, very traumatic uh, experience for your parents to start with. How did they deal with it? And uh, uh, you, what are your childhood memories? The initial response, like you said, is like, you know, beyond trauma, it was like shock. It was disbelief. It was like, you know, everything's all right with these chaps. But what is the issue? Why, why, how can someone's eyesight go and deteriorate? I mean, they have better eyesight and how can it go and deteriorate there? And he's able to play table tennis now. How can he not even see a whole car coming and hitting him? How can he miss a platform on the railway station and fall on the other side? So those are kinds of things that, you know, uh, my parents had to deal with. Uh, a lot more than parents is, you know, no one's really trained for parenting. So a lot of people, uh, as I mean, a lot of parents look to their, uh, you know, primary, secondary supports. They look to the elders, their fifth peers to, uh, you know, kind of support them through this, to help them understand what's going on. And that's also important that, you know, uh, there be a better uh, a better way uh, where people respond. You know, you can't have people uh, responding with superstition and all of uh, those kinds of things. So, so the immediate thing which happened uh, for uh, us as a family was that there was an entire fault finding. Oh no, this is because of bad genes from your family or bad genes from uh, this side of the family and those kinds of things. So, uh, it was it was initially quite. Uh, you know, uh, disheartening. Uh, but but I, I did see that my father uh, never really let the standards be lowered. He never stopped expecting us to perform well. He was himself uh, a very high achiever and he himself would always have us, uh, you, know, um, you know, look at the best, want to be the best and, you know, outdo whatever our previous performances were. So in that regard, that, that's something that I got from my dad. My mom was someone who said that, you know, you shouldn't give up on any of your dreams. You should just look to uh, God. You, you, and and then she's, she's someone who really supported me in my faith and my journey uh, through this is something that I have learned so much from her. Uh, that, that sense of, you know, God's got the best for you. I mean, this is not some sort of a punishment from God. This is not some sort of a problem that he wished that only you carry or any of those things. It, it, it's something that even through this, he is going to do something good. He's going to do something great uh, through you. And I think that's really happened. Um, I don't think that uh, given a chance, I would want to go back and change uh, something about my journey because I feel it's made me rich. Uh, I'm rich with uh, a lot of learning and experience and maturity. Uh, those kinds of things are there. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sharad, that uh, you shared uh, your part of your professional journey, your personal journeys. Uh, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Wish you very best as we go forward. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I This podcast was brought to you by Score Foundation. Yeah, Roshani, 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 Roshani,